Well, first of all, I wanted to show off my overcome tie um, that I received in the mail. And I, I'm really grateful to Runsi. I've known her for over 10 years for just being so persistent and growing overcome into the amazing organization it is. I am delighted to be here today and I'm, I'm looking at the chat and it looks like so many people from around the country are, uh, and perhaps even around the world are on today. Um, I'm gonna provide an overview because you're gonna hear from so many brilliant speakers throughout this event who will be more, a lot more specific about uh, different treatments, different clinical trials. And what I wanna do today is give you my perspective, not only as a gynecologic oncologist, uh, where I, I continue to treat patients, perform surgeries, provide chemotherapy, enroll patients in clinical trials, but I'm also a surgeon scientist, a physician scientist who runs a lab. So I wanted to give you a perspective of where we're headed from both of those, um, both of those avenues. So these are my disclosures, and um, I, as you can see, I'm I'm dedicated and passionate about providing um, scientific and medical advice to a number of organizations, and in particular, you'll see a theme where I am really interested in advocating for patients, uh, for survivors, uh, and also for training the next generation. So we have a continued pipeline of people who are asking these questions: where we're headed. Advancements in ovarian cancer care have definitely improved outcomes. Uh, and this is the spectrum of care from risk reduction, where we now know that in patients' families who have hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, that we can intervene at that level where we can perform genetic cascade testing of entire families and, and intervene with either providing oral contraceptives to prevent ovarian cancer or performing um, surgeries to remove the ovaries and fallopia tubes before ovarian cancer develops. We are getting better in diagnosing ovarian cancer, although not good enough. We still don't have a good screening tool or a good method of early detection, but we certainly are able to diagnose it in a way with our imaging, CT scans, ultrasounds, where we can intervene surgically. And we have pretty good ways of diagnosing recurrence. Um, and then we're going to talk about treatment in a moment, but I, I think that there a lot more attention is being paid to long-term survivorship because people are living longer with a diagnosis of ovarian cancer, and we have to think about uh, symptom management and palliative care along the way, and I'm really happy to see that Dr. Lori Spuzak is one of your speakers at this event to talk about that. Well, here is an example of a treatment journey. This is, you know, each, each person's journey and uh, cancer care and treatment is different, but this is just an overall view of an example of somebody who presents with symptoms um, and ends up having surgery. The symptoms are relieved if there's a complete tumor debulking and there's no residual cancer that can be seen with the visible eye. That's followed by platinum-based chemotherapy. And after the platinum-based chemotherapy, um, some people are, are following uh, this treatment with maintenance therapy with PARP inhibitors or other types of treatment. And then um, what, we know, what we know now based on these advancements in initial treatment, especially if there's excellent tumor response, that people are living longer and longer and longer. Unfortunately, ovarian cancer, especially advanced stage ovarian cancer, tends to come back. And so there are options for additional second, third, fourth, et cetera, lines of treatment, potential surgery, depending on, on what's going on. Uh, but despite these advances, lots more work is needed. I wanna talk about some of the clinical nuances that we think about regarding response to initial treatment. And these are just clinical, um, clinical diagnoses. So they're kind of arbitrary if you look at these uh, in, in terms of months. We talk about platinum chemotherapy sensitivity, meaning the initial tumor responses to that initial therapy. So if the tumor comes back, the tumors come back and cancer recurs within 
zero to three months of initial diagnosis and treatment, it's considered platinum refractory. If it occurs within six months, it's considered platinum resistant tumor type. And then greater than six months, it's sensitive, partially sensitive, six to 12 months, and very sensitive, greater than 12 months. And so you look at this and say, well, you know, is there a big difference between five months versus eight months? And so this is sort of a clinical continuum, and it gives us some idea of the response of tumors, but you can, you can um, imagine that it's not very scientific. However, we do apply this to the types of treatment we would offer for recurrence. So the types of treatment offered for recurrence, if the initial tumor has shown to be, the disease has shown to be platinum sensitive, then we would retreat with a platinum-based uh, regimen. If it's been shown to be platinum resistant, then we would not retreat with platinum. And often I describe this as, um, you know, resistance is when we think about when bacteria become resistant to antibiotics. More is not always better. And in fact, if you treat um, uh, a bacteria that's resistant to a certain antibiotic, maybe it may even make it grow more. So I use that analogy to think about cancer cells, that if a cancer cell has become resistant to a chemotherapy, more is not better. And in fact, it could make things worse. We have now recognize that there are certain types of maintenance therapy that follow that are a company and then are or and or are followed after our platinum chemotherapy that include CARP inhibitors, which I'll talk about, vascular endothelial growth factor inhibitors or Avastin, and uh, these are alone or combined with some immunotherapies. And I've got to pause here to just say that a lot of our initial immunotherapy clinical trials we're very, very disappointing in ovarian cancer, but we're recognizing new ways of thinking about immunotherapy and um, in using antibody drug conjugates at really targeting the tumor. And I'm not gonna talk about those today, but those, those types of treatment are coming down the pipe. So when we're treating uh, ovarian cancer that has come back, there are certain things that we think about. First of all, when the cancer comes back, people have symptoms from tumor. So part of the treatment is to relieve those symptoms. And we really want to be able to provide a treatment that's going to maximize the time a person has without symptoms from the cancer, without symptoms from the tumor. At the same time, we want to be very careful. We don't want to give treatment that's gonna make a person feel much worse than they felt when they had the cancer. So it's a balancing act. We wanna get rid of the cancer, we get rid of the tumor, but how do we do this in such a way that we're not causing more side effects and making a person feel worse? Sometimes we do this if it's temporary, but sometimes these treatments cause permanent side effects. And sometimes they're so toxic that they could shorten a person's life. So um, I'm going to stick on this slide just for a minute to, to talk about how we choose treatments for recurrent disease. First of all, we need to make sure that's going to target the tumor. Secondly, we need to make sure it can relieve the cancer-related symptoms. Third, we need to think about survivorship and quality of life. What are we doing all this for? For a person to live as long as possible with as good a quality of life as possible and delay this time from symptoms from the cancer. And then we can measure this with some of our imaging with objective responses to see if we've stabilized these tumor nodules that we're following, if they've regressed, or sometimes people are able to achieve a complete remission. So where are we headed? Where are we headed? Um, we want to go in the direction around this bend to biomarker-directed treatment biomarker-directed treatment. And we're getting closer and closer to that. And I wanna give an example using uh, the story of the PARP inhibitors. So PARP inhibitors are polyadenosine diphosphate or ADP ribose polymerase inhibitors. So you can see why we just say PARP because this is a long word, long series of words strung together. And what has 
been um, known for you know at least over uh, 15 years is that these drugs cause what's called synthetic lethality in tumors and cancers with BRCA1 and 2 mutations. So this is not unique to ovarian cancer. When we talk about BRCA1 and 2 mutations, these mutations can occur in breast cancer, prostate cancer, pancreatic cancers. I'm going to take you through a little biology here where we see double-strand DNA over here and um, different types of DNA damage. A single-strand break is here and double-strand break when both sides of the DNA are broken. There are very efficient ways our bodies repair DNA damage. One is by base excision of repair and the protein that's really important in that is a PARP1. And then in double strand breaks, the most efficient repair is homologous recombination to repair these breaks. And proteins involved in that process include BRCA1 and 2. So the very mutations that are found that predispose people to developing breast, ovarian, and pancreatic cancers are actually targets for treatment because if you don't have good functioning BRCA1 and 2, then DNA damaging drugs like platinum chemotherapy and PARP inhibitors are more likely to be effective in those tumors. And that's what we mean by synthetic lethality. Another example is over here. So the PARP1, if we target it with a PARP inhibitor, it doesn't work. If you have a tumor that doesn't have BRCA1 and 2, you can't repair the DNA damage and that causes cell death. That's a sensitive tumor cell. Normal cells can repair single strand and double strand breaks and the cells survive. Now, the way cancer cells become resistant to PARP inhibitors is that they reactivate the expression of normal BRCA1 and 2 and become resistant to the PARP inhibitor treatment. But this is biomarker developed therapy or directed therapy, and we can see the success of this. This is the SOLO1 phase three trial, gynecologic oncology group trial number 3004, where um, patients were in, enrolled, people were enrolled in this uh, trial comparing maintenance alaparib, that's in the blue, compared to placebo after initial treatment with cytotoxic platinum-based chemotherapy, this was followed up with um, these, uh, this experimental design, Olaparib versus placebo in patients with newly diagnosed advanced stage ovarian cancer and BRCA mutations. And what was just published this year, hot off the press, is seven-year follow-up. There has been a clinically meaningful overall improvement in overall survival and a hazard ratio of 50, 0.55. So there's a 45% or a better chance of long-term survival with um, alaparib compared to placebo. And so although this was not found to be statistically significant, this is very, very meaningfully um, meaningful clinically. Um, as you can see on the bottom, these are months. Uh, this is 102 months. This is really quite remarkable. And the curves are not overlapping. And uh, so I, I would say this is a huge win, but we have to then think about is more better. And now we know the same time that this remarkable landmark study, the follow-up of it is published. At the same time, we see that other PARP inhibitors, including Olaparib, we don't recommend use um, for later term uh, treatment when uh, the tumors have come back for third or fourth recurrences. So this is where uh, we encourage people to use it in indicated situations, particularly for patients who have BRCA1 and mutations in the upfront setting maintenance therapy. So this is, this is sort of the highlight example of uh, biomarker targeted therapy where in general, we used to just treat everybody with a combination of surgery and platinum-based chemotherapy just solely based on the histology, meaning what the cancer looked like under the microscope. And we really want to move towards personalized precision therapy targeted to patients' tumors, biomarket-directed therapy. Unfortunately, a little bit different from other types of cancers, 
we don't have a lot of individual mutations in high-grade serous ovarian cancer, um, except for P53. And then we talked about BRCA1 and 2 mutations. True mutations only account for about um, at most 20% of those cancers, but we have other types uh, of proteins in that homologous re recombination pathway that act like BRCA mutation and may be more sensitive to platinum and PARP inhibitors. Um, but then there's about 49% of those tumors that are BRCA1 and 2 wild type, meaning they don't have mutations, and they're homologous recombination proficient, meaning they are very efficient at repairing DNA damage. And because I'm quite stubborn as a surgeon scientist, I'm really interested in, in thinking about how we improve treatment for these types of tumors. So I'm gonna pause here and spend about five minutes just talking about uh, some of the work I'm doing in my own lab and the thinking we have about where we go from here and some of the challenges we have in trying to move our research from the bench to the bedside and back. So um, I'm gonna use a lot of terms, but I'm just gonna talk about it hopefully at a very high level that when we talk about DNA and genetics, we also need to talk about what regulates genes. And these are called epigenetic modifiers. And what we're really interested in is epigenetic mechanisms. Those things that, those proteins that can regulate genes can be manipulated in a way that we can't directly manipulate genes themselves. And these in general call readers, writers, and erasers of gene regulation. And in the blue, are the types of drugs that we study in my lab. What's interesting about these drugs is many of them work really, really well for hematologic malignancies like leukemias and don't work as well as single agents in solid tumors like ovarian cancer, but there may be a space for them and for some of them that actually target DNA damage. And so one of the questions we asked many, many years ago was do some of these HDAC inhibitors, can they cause DNA damage on their own? And if they do, we would select them to study as promising drugs for ovarian cancer treatment. So this is one of the assays we perform in our lab. We can actually measure DNA damage. The blue is a nucleus, it's in the cell, it's where DNA is located. And these green dots show where DNA damage at double strand breaks is occurring. And we can count these dots to let us know how much DNA damage is occurring in these cells. And then this picture shows the different types of drugs that we screened. And, and the ones that I've circled are the drugs that we selected to study more um, in ovarian cancer. We have other assays to look at DNA damage. And in fact, we chose cell lines that are not BRCA mutated to study because we're really interested in improving the response to treatment in those types of cells. So in these two cell lines, we performed another assay that looks at DNA damage and we measured the tail of damage in these green tails. They look like comets, it's called a comet assay. And we can count how much DNA damage is occurring. In this particular assay, we looked at Olaparib, the PARP inhibitor, with an HDAC inhibitor and tinostat. And in the combination, you can see that we have much more DNA damage in these cells when we combine these two drugs. So in cells that don't really respond as well to Olaparib, the PARP inhibitor, that are BRCA wild type, the response is improved when we combine it with this HDAC inhibitor. And we asked, why is this occurring? Well, what we're doing is we're reprogramming these cancer cells that don't have a BRCA mutation, what we're doing is we're downregulating those BRCA1 and 2 and other genes in that pathway. We're downregulating their expression. So the protein in, in response to the HDAC inhibitor, this is another one of the drugs we study called Saha. You can see here that untreated, there's lots of this RAD51 and BRCA1 protein that exists. But if you add the HDAC inhibitor, we've downregulated it. There's less of that protein. So we're making these cells that have BRCA functioning very well. We're downregulating its expression so it doesn't function as well. So we make the cells act like they have a BRCA mutation. 
That's the high level concept. And so we were able to take this concept over several years and with a variety of different combinations of drugs, we're combining the PARP inhibitor with other types of HDAC inhibitors. In this particular case, we were looking at panobinostat, and this is in a BRCA wild type, again, doesn't have a mutation. If we, um, we conducted a, a preclinical trial in our mice and we compared vehicle control to panobinostat, the HDAC inhibitor, to olaparib alone, to the combination. And all I want you to look at is the control. This is the tumor size. And here are the tumors here. If you look at the control versus the combination, the individual versus the combination, that the combination of drugs was able to decrease the tumor volume and weights in these mice. And when we took these tumors out and measured the amount of BRCA in the combination, BRCA1, it had reduced as well. And we had increased DNA damage with a combination. In another model, this is a mouse model that we developed from patient tumor that we put into these mice and the mice develop ascites, the fluid that is in the belly and widespread tumor that we often see in human beings. And we're able to match the tumor molecular appearance with staining for P53, Pax8 and wild type and WT1, which match high grade serous ovarian cancer. When we performed a survival assay comparing the vehicle to individual drugs to the combination, the mice that have the combination treatment lived longer. And then finally, I'm sorry, my slides are a little stuck. Woo. Well, my whole computer is crashing. Never happened to me before, one second. Technical difficulties. Let me stop sharing for a moment. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's never happened to me before. Um, let me open it back up to where I was. And wow. It has completely crashed. Okay. I'm trying to reopen my PowerPoint and um, give me a second. There we go. It's because I'm showing a huge, huge file perhaps. I'm gonna reshare. Hopefully you can see that. Um, okay, and so um, I just have a couple slides left. Um, one of the ways that the HDAC inhibitors can also stall DNA, DNA progression, uh, replication fork progression. So this is another way that we are reprogramming our ovarian cancer cells that don't have a BRCA mutation to act like they do. And so this is the schema here where we treat with a PARP inhibitor that blocks single strand breaks. If single strand breaks are not repaired, they cause double strand breaks. PARP also causes, PARP inhibitors also cause PARP trapping that stresses the DNA during replication and that prevents proper DNA repair. If we treat with an HDAC inhibitor, for instance, like antinostat, we have shown that we can block or downregulate homologous recombination gene expression, expression of genes like BRCA1 and BRCA2, and we can also stall replication for progression. That's the picture here. And that prevents adequate DNA repair. So combined, when you don't repair your DNA properly, you cause increased double strand breaks and eventually cell death. And so this is some of the work we did in the lab that eventually led to a phase one, two trial of a lab rib with antinostat for treating recurrent platinum resistant homologous recombination repair proficient 
those cancers that have BRCA1 and 2 wild type not mutated, ovarian primary peritoneal and fallopian tube cancers. This was a huge um, investigator initiated trial. We started at Vanderbilt, uh, University of Kansas joined, and we were just about to join as WashU. I was a translational PI here. And then it closed early due to poor accrual in the middle of the pandemic because of COVID and poor staffing. So we don't have the results of the ultimate trial, but we do have some patient samples. We actually have one patient who was a long-term responder to this who was on this medication for over a year, the combination for over a year. So what we do in our lab is perform cell culture, uh, growing cancer cells from established and primary ovarian cancer, cell lines, spheroids, and organoids in our Petri dishes, treating with a variety of drugs in combination with epigenetic drugs, combining platinum or PARP inhibitor with these new drugs we're talking about. We look at cell viability and growth we perform these molecular assays, and then we perform additional, more sophisticated genomics, et cetera, on these tumor samples. And then what we do from the clinical trial is we want to perform some of these assays to see if we can measure any markers of response. So um, I've given you a four or five slide snapshot of a decade's worth of work. And there are a ton of people who are involved, a ton of funding is involved in this. And so my last two slides are just to encourage people to continue to advocate and raise awareness about ovarian cancer. Um, Overcome as an organization has led in this effort to remind people that ovarian cancer is not silent. We have to listen and we have to advocate. We desperately need more funds for better ovarian cancer care and ovarian cancer research. We need to learn about symptoms and overcome has the beach symptoms that we talk about. We need to look carefully as physicians and as family members and as ourselves. We need to understand our own history and our family histories. And we need to advocate for appropriate exams and tests. We do not have any good screening for ovarian cancer um, to date. And so there are many labs who are looking to improve that, but we have made improvements in treatment and I'm so excited about that. I'd like to end with trusted therapeutic partnerships. Um, you know, I've shared today some of my expertise, my medical knowledge, some of my scientific knowledge, and my lived experience as a GYN oncologist and a physician scientist. Uh, but I want to say that we need to do a better job of learning and listening to patients, families, and communities who have self-knowledge about their bodies, their situations, what's going to work best with them, and their lived experiences. And I would say I borrowed this from Ikana, which is the Endometrial Cancer African American um, uh, uh, Alliance steering group, Margie, who says, make sure that you find peace with your doctor. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing and thank you all for your time and attention.